Well, welcome everyone to our uh, organic gardening class course, whatever you want to call it. Uh, my name is Al Johnson and I'll be your instructor for tonight and for the next uh, four sessions. And I am uh, kind of thrilled to be uh, doing this as a webinar is um, we, uh, I actually have done this course for 10 out of the last 12 years in a different county in New Jersey, but uh, this is really the first time we've ever tried this as a webinar. Possibly the first uh, educational event that's been run by NOFA, uh, any of the NOFA chapters. Um, uh, so you guys might be in an historic event tonight. Um, <clears throat> so I'll give you a little bit of my background. I've been uh, an organic gardener or farmer for the last 40 something years. Uh, and uh, for the last 30, 31 years, I've been also been an organic inspector. Um, so um, I, we will be seeing a lot of slides tonight. Uh, majority of probably taking my own garden and I will be referring to my own garden experience. I have uh, a um, plot that's approximately 35 to 40 uh, square foot, although it's not a square, uh, but it's about 1500 square feet. And I am located in Titusville, New Jersey, which is central Jersey. We're not too far away from the Delaware, uh, Delaware River. We may get a little bit of a climate uh, influence from the river, but uh, we're uphill a bit, so probably not too much, just to give you a base for where I'm uh, speaking from. And uh, I want to thank the Unitarian Universalist Church at Washington Crossing as, uh, our, as our co-sponsor. They were providing us a room where we we're going to do this in person. Uh, and I think we, I know we have several people on the call tonight from, uh, that, that are members. Uh, so thank you for your support and, uh, and welcome. Um, a little bit of a short, short, uh, spiel on, on NOFA because I know about half of you, uh, signed up as non-members. Uh, we are a chapter pr primarily, um, uh, of, uh, gardeners, farmers, and food activists. I guess that would, would cover the majority of our, of our, uh, membership. Um, and we are one of seven chapters in the Northeast, uh, which includes New York, New Jersey, and then five out of the six New England states, all except for Maine, which has their own organization. Um, and as a little aside, NOFA will be celebrating its 50th anniversary um, next year, 2021. And like I say, you guys might be uh, participating in a historic event tonight, which um, uh, we're not sure about that. Um, but just a, a quick note, NOFA is uh, dedicated to supporting organic and sustainable food systems and, and agriculture uh, in New Jersey through education, technical assistance, and policy action. Um, let's see. Um, I, I have sent, or I'm sorry, Nagisa, who is in, uh, administrating this um, uh, uh, meeting, um, has sent out a handout to everybody. It's eight pages, and I am going to be referring to that uh, periodically. Um, <clears throat> there are um, several times when I may refer to it directly. Uh, I'm going to share my screen eventually. And when I do, uh, I, there are several um, uh, ways you can escape the full screen. I think if you put your cursor up top, um, you can exit full screen. So you can look at your, um, at your uh, handout. Uh, I would, however, uh, bring up the idea of printing it out. You're all on mute right now, I believe. Uh, and so if you put something on the printer, then um, uh, we won't hear your printer going. So um, uh, again, today is the first of four sessions. It's the most basic session. So some of you that may, um, say I know most of this stuff, hopefully you'll learn something new tonight, uh, hopefully a lot new, uh, but uh, it's, um, it's gonna be the most basic. Uh, we'll start getting into more, uh, more advanced things next week, but they're not so advanced that it is a basic uh, beginning gardener, you um, won't get anything out of it. Uh, let's see, and also it might help to shut down other uh, applications on your computer. Um, it, it makes, uh, it makes the screen a little bit easier. Uh, you'll get less of a delay, I believe. And uh, if, if my mouth is not synced with my sound, uh, that, that might help. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, again, uh, uh, we, we realize when we schedule this that next week is uh, scheduled on Passover. Uh, but these sessions will be recorded and uh, we'll make those available to you. So, uh, you know, we're sorry we, we 
had only uh, Thursdays, and we, we want to make it simple, not switch around uh, different days of the week. So, uh, okay, so let's get let's get started. I have this session tonight uh, uh, segmented into uh, site selection, uh, watering, um, and uh, I'm going to go into a real prim primer on fencing. Uh, I could talk for an hour and a half on fencing, and I'm not going to get into that detail, but I'm, I want to put out some ideas for those of you that are new. And um, I consider, at least in our area, that fencing is essential because uh, deer will, deer particularly, will, will decimate us. So first of all, since some of these are going to go through pretty quickly, and we'll end with, with uh, planting, um, uh, planting schedule. So let's see. Uh, let's put it on slideshow. And um, okay, so site selection, um, you know, basically the, the uh, primary concern is sun. Uh, well, one of the primary concerns is sun. Um, so I happen to be on a neighbor's property. Those trees you see in the background are my neighbors and he's let me cut a few down. I had a couple of getting really big and luckily Hurricane Sandy knocked down two of the three biggest ones. So uh, I, even with those trees got uh, in the background got a little bit bigger. I still have pretty good sunlight there. On the left hand side is the east. I don't get quite as good a sun in the east, but I have uh, full sun in, in the west, so I'm, I'm in pretty good shape. The other thing is water. You need to be, uh, you need to make sure you have access to water. It doesn't mean you have to be, you know, a place where you can stretch a hose to your, to your garden, uh, although that would be really helpful. Uh, but at least one is, it's uh, water sources nearby that you can, um, you can get some water however uh, however you're going to deliver it um basically most most important when you're well, watering new plants i'm sorry when you're, when you're putting in new plants whether they be seedlings seedling transplants or seeds water is most important then and water is most important in the uh, summertime particularly when the um when it's hot out ground dries out very quickly the Ground holds moisture pretty good this time of year in the spring and pretty good in the fall. So the watering is less uh, critical. Um, water is critical, but uh, you need to water less often. So uh, <clears throat> go, I'm gonna go a couple uh, quick, quickly through a few means of delivering water. Um, this is a soaker hose available in most garden supply stores. Um, certainly a tractor supply, Agway and most of your local garden supply stores will have this. Um, it, it is made from recycled tires, and I've been told that um, all the lead and, and uh, metals have been taken out. I don't know that for a fact, but uh, somebody that, that seems to work in the industry said, yeah, they, they, that's the reason they recycle them is to get all those metals out to them. And, but if you're at all concerned about that, um, this is a uh, soaker hose also. It looks a little bit more like a regular garden hose, and I think it's made of the same material. Um, but it's a material that apparently doesn't uh, decompose. Um, now, that is an issue when you leave things outside, is the sunlight can be harsh on them. Um, <clears throat> I think I've had this outside for five or six years, but it's generally buried under a mulch. I, I mulch on top of it, so I, it's not an issue with sun, sunlight. My own just plain garden hose, which we probably all have, uh, I have one length that's been sitting outside um, every day in the summertime for 15 years and I see no sign of decomposition. So I don't think there's an issue. Uh, there is issues with different types of plastic. I'm not a chemist, so I can't name the types of plastic, but uh, it doesn't seem to be an issue with the, with the um, irrigation materials I'm gonna show here. The other is uh, drip tape. It's um, it's actually used extensively on farms because uh, it's easy to put in. Uh, I'm not crazy about it because it's, it, it's got a shorter life. Now, again, I have one section that's in my strawberries. It's a permanent bed of strawberries that's been in for uh, probably four years, but uh, you know, leaves are on top of it. it. There's not much exposure to the sun and it seems to be st still in good shape. I haven't tested it this year yet, but uh, it's, it's cheap, um, and hopefully if you have to throw it away, you have a way to recycle the plastic, but I uh, will have to leave that up to you. Uh, so it's, it's pretty easy to assemble too. Uh, I'll give you a little demo here. 
basically slide that on, tighten this and try to pull it and it's, it's on securely. So, um, and, and then there are, there are attachments that will hook up right to your regular garden hose. This is a filter, filters out any uh, impurities, uh, sand particularly, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a pretty good system. Uh, let's see, okay, I do a lot of spraying. Um, I, I would highly suggest getting a good nozzle. Uh, some of the nozzles that are straight, you just have to kind of screw them and unscrew them. And uh, they're, they're difficult to get to, um, to, to handle when you're in garden. This one's very easy, it's got a handle. There are others that are sold by some garden supply uh, catalogs. Uh, possibly some seed catalogs, but this one you can pick up at most hardware stores. Uh, it, it's easy on the hand, and I can control the I can control the spray just by how tightly I pull in that nozzle. So if I'm trying to reach the far end of the of the garden, a far end of a bed, uh, rather than having to walk along the bed, uh, I can generally reach about probably 25 feet with a uh, with good spray like this. Just as a matter of enticement for a, um, for what, uh, I think it's the last class or talking about uh, extending your season. In the background, you're looking at uh, three of my nine existing kale plants. Those were planted last July 1st. And as you see, we've been eating a lot of kale and we've got a lot more kale. Um, I know that right now there's a real concern about going to the grocery store. Uh, because we're in the middle of the COVID um, uh, pandemic, whatever, uh, and I've got a lot of I've got a lot of food left still. So, uh, an enticement to um, garden and garden well. <laughs> um, okay, don't forget the old watering can. Um, there are some cheap brands at the store that will will uh, I mean it, I maybe drugstore not drugstores hardware stores uh, that will probably. Um, not give you the, the real sprinkle that, that this one does. Uh, I looked around at watering cans for a while and it actually happened to win this in a raffle, but it was, um, it, it's a high quality watering can. I think it's called the French watering can. It's available but from uh, a gardener supply. Uh, and uh, I'm not saying that your local har um, garden supply store or a farm supply store, whatever, doesn't have good quality ones. They probably, they, quite likely do, but be careful of buying the real cheap ones because the, the water comes out in too much of a stream and it can cause erosion, it can wash seeds away, whatever. Uh, this is a really, really good one. I've had it for maybe 20 years and it doesn't so, show any sign of deterioration. Um, okay, no matter whether, if you're watering by a watering can or probably with the hose, um, I want you to think of a concept here. That is a sheen. It's, it's a shiny, shining of the you know, water that's puddling on top of the, the soil. That means that the water is, in, is uh, I'm adding water at a faster rate than it's infiltrating. So it's time for me to go on, move down the row, go to the next plant, whatever, and give that a few seconds, a few minutes, whatever, to sink in. So, this is a way that you can, can kind of control the water in your own plot by counting the number of sheens it took to get that water down to where you ever want to get it, which is usually considered to be you know, at least six inches. So when you're just starting out, try this out after like, I've never done any watering without going through three sheens, but Try it three sheens and then try digging a little hole and see how far the water went down. Now it's probably going to take a few minutes for it to go down all the way, but um, so if, if it's only down an inch or two, go back and give a few more sheens and, and find out what your soil takes. And even within your own garden, it may be different in different areas, uh, different places of the garden. And it's different in the summertime than it is in the spring and fall. Spring and fall, there's generally moisture in the soil. Uh, at the lower parts of the soil that um, will make uh, basically uh, watering a lot easier. I, I have to give, I have places where I often give seven sheens in the summertime where I only give three or four spring and fall. So get to know your soil and uh, if you have a watering can, you have a, a spray nozzle, um, you know, this, this is a good opportunity to, to figure out how, how quickly water will infiltrate into your soil. 
Okay, uh, I'll call this the fencing primer, primer, yeah, primer. Because <laughs> um, again, I can talk for an hour and a half on fencing, but I want to go over a couple of key concepts. Um, this is a neighbor that actually fenced their whole garden in, I mean, their whole backyard in, which, um, which is, is a possibility. Uh, and that will protect you from deer. Deer seems to be the worst problem, but uh, groundhogs uh, and to a certain extent rabbits can also be a problem. Uh, so I will, um, again, uh, this is a smaller gar small garden, um, uh, four corners, there's a gate over the other side, which we'll see in a minute, when we get to the gates. Um, these green posts, you can pick them up at most uh, supply stores and they're fairly easy to bang in. I, I don't actually like them that much because I, I say, they say they're easy to bang in, I don't find it that easy. Um, but they only go probably about a foot into the ground and they, they're supposed to give a fairly, uh, be, be fairly steady there. Um, it, it's not your strongest uh, fencing system, but it works for a small area. Um, there are metal pipes. Uh, this is not a garden. It's actually our, uh, next, the state park next to our, our property uh, that's trying to fence in a deer, an area to keep the deer out just to see uh, how that affects the vegetation and regrowth. And, uh, forest regrowth, whatever, but um, they they are generally sold by uh, mail order. Uh, there are several companies that are in your resources on uh, page either seven or eight. I don't remember where the fencing se section is. Um, I've used one to fence in a lot of my yard, uh, independent of the garden, and uh, I've used McGregor, which is um, uh, McGregor's, I think, invisible fence, which is one of those resources. Is, and there's another one in there, Bremer. Uh, Brenner or Brenner, um, which uh, I have some neighbors that have used and they're happy with it. Um, I'm real happy with the service. Uh, if you have a, a technical question, you can call up and get an answer. They're, they're real good about answering. And they've actually, uh, when I put in my initial order, they call me back and say, I don't, we don't think you need that. And they convinced me yeah, not to buy something. So I like companies that, that convince me not to buy something. I trust them. Uh, just another, uh, you know, again, a neighbor that um, fenced the whole yard in and then tried to uh, put another fence in to keep the dogs out. I don't know if they keep, kept the groundhogs out, but. Um, and then this is actually, you can't see the fence on the right hand side, but this is a, a plot that's only six foot wide. And it's not a very big plot, it's probably, uh, you know, eight to 10 foot long and six foot wide. Uh, and, the, and the fence uh, is only three foot high. Uh, and I, I lived in this place years ago. That's my 32 year old son. Um, and um, uh, what I found was that it's such a small area, the deer won't jump the fence. Uh, I mean, it's possible that if we were in a real drought and everything uh, on, on the inside was green, everything on the outside was brown, they might, but they don't have very good depth perception. They're afraid of small areas. So uh, I put a three foot fence in because that's what was in the shed. We were just renting this place. Uh, uh, you know, I would have put a higher fence in if I, if I had it, but I didn't, and it, and it was never a problem. Okay, I want to, uh, uh, as part of this um, fencing primer, primer uh, I want to talk about two critical areas because um, uh, they are fairly important gates. Okay, this is a hinge gate. Uh, it seems to be working fairly well. Uh, I won't go into the construction. Um, uh, one that's made a little bit more sturdy. There's four by fours on the side and, and um, you know, very uh, well-made uh, gate. Again, it's hinged. Um, a th a third uh, example, uh, purchased, um, my uh, uh, friend Adrian, he purchased the, the gate, I think at Tractor Supply, but certainly uh, any agricultural um, uh, store would have gates. And then he has his own posts on the side, which are four of, I think that's an eight foot gate. It looks like it's kind of short. You have to stoop down, but I, I think it's eight foot. So uh, just in a, uh, okay, so here's the problem with, with gates. Um, sometimes when you have a hinge gate, there's things that block it, it from opening. This opens up, it opens uphill actually. It wasn't a great design. Uh, and here's what's happening is the, the screws are pulling out. So it's putting too much strain on this gate. Um, first of all, what, what should have been done was to, instead of using those, those screws, to screw one piece of wood to another, should have used carriage bolts. A carriage bolt is designed to go through, through both pieces of wood and you can tighten it from the end. This is, uh, pretend that my two fingers here, my two fingers there are two pieces of wood, and then you can tighten it. Um, this is a fairly large, uh, you know, they come in all sizes. 
Um, uh, I highly prefer if you have any, um, you know, the resources and you've got a fairly large space, a sliding gate. Um, this, uh, let's do this. Um, this area, oops, uh, okay, here we go. Uh, this uh, contraption here, it's, it's called the barn gate, um, I think a barn gate slide or something like that, and, and this hardware comes with it. Um, it probably costs uh, close to $100. And then I made my, my actual gate, the wood on there is cedar, which is a lot more expensive than pine. Um, but it's a lot more long lasting too. So I probably paid about $120 for that whole contraption. But as you notice, I have, have kids, had kids at home at the time. Kids are notorious for not shutting out lights. They're notorious for not closing doors. And all, all my kids have to do, or me too, is just give this a little push. And there's a little latch there that keeps it closed, keeps the deer out. And uh, uh, it's, it's worked quite well. So it was, to me, it was worth the investment of a, of a um, more expensive gate. Um, another sliding, uh, this is a neighbor, another sliding uh, gate, which is a little sim more simple. I believe that's an electric conduit pipe up the top. And, I don't know. He was an in, he's an engineer, so I'm not sure he rigged those. Uh, whoops, uh, he rigged those uh, pointer again. Uh, he rigged these up himself, or he bought them at a hardware store. But you probably can jerry rig something like that. Uh, a lot less cost than than mine. Not uh, as tight, but um, and I don't know if it'd be as as kid proof. Probably would, but. Um, uh, again, just a, a less cost uh, application. Um, corners, I, I also want to go on to corners before we um, uh, talk about corners before we go on for fencing. Uh, <clears throat> back to that first garden shot we saw, it's a, um, a four by four, probably a treated post. Um, if you're certified organic, treated posts are not allowed. Um, but in your garden, I'm not gonna tell you what you can and can't do because you can't really get much else. Um, if you think back to the shot I showed of my own garden, uh, a couple shots back, um, these are all locust posts. I was able to get locust posts cut for me by an Amish farmer, but he doesn't do it anymore. Um, being an organic inspector, I'm in the Lancaster area a lot. Um, they do, however, sell uh, eight foot locust posts. Um, so you could, if you sunk that two and a half feet in the ground, you could get a five and a half foot height out of it and possibly put something in to extend it to six feet. Um, I take care of a garden at our church, which has always had a five foot fence and it's, it's always worked. Deer do not like to jump if they don't have to. If, if there were a drought and everything outside was brown and everything uh, on the inside was green, then they might be tempted to jump my six foot fence. And if they were, if you notice um, on my corner posts, which are um, probably nine feet out, eight or nine feet out of the ground, I have these little eye screws. They're basically just a screw with a, with a hole on the end. Uh, I have them spaced about every nine inches. And then this is what you call a, um, uh, an, uh, an insulator. Uh, it's, it's used for electrical fences to, um, uh, I guess, run electrical fences along, along wooden fences. But I could run some more string along the top of my fence if I had to, if, uh, if the deer were, were getting. Uh, jumping over, but it's never happened in the 16 years that I've had that fence in. Okay, so uh, a little bit more uh, back to corners. Uh, they can be braced, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and this is a simple way to brace this. It's just some two by fours that are going into, going into the ground, uh, fairly effective. Uh, this is what I would probably call the Cadillac of, um, of uh, bracing. It's my yard again, those are treated posts, it's not my garden. But the, the concept here is the, um, the, the post in the middle, that's your corner. And the ones on the other side are your brace posts. So basically the two ones on the side are there only to hold the corner in place. And <clears throat> this is the, I forget what you call it. Maybe this is actually the brace. Uh, so, so basically that piece right there runs from my brace post to my corner and this wire tightens the two together. So it brings them in really tight and this corner is never gonna go any place. I'll show you some details. Again, I'm not gonna get into a lot of details on fencing, just trying to give you a primer, some ideas. Um, if you have questions about this, 
uh, and you want more information, um, I, I'd be happy to give it to you. And I think you, you can just uh, contact uh, the NOFA uh, website with questions and the geese will, um, will forward them on to me. Uh, this pin right here, <clears throat> that is a metal pin that goes through that post into here, so it's holding that tight. There's one on the other side. And then I'll show you some details of this. It's called the fence strainer. Um, okay, there's your pin. And there's my, you can see my wire uh, going, oops. Uh, trying to figure out how to use these, pin, these pins, okay. Uh, there's my, uh, my wire, this, the, the tightener right there. Again, I'll show you a, a close up of that um, right, right here. Uh, it can be tightened, tightened with a, uh, an adjustable wrench. Um, they also make these, uh, a little bit of variation on these that has a, a tool that uh, does not have this, this same type of tightener, but um, no, no need to buy that if you're just putting one or two. Um, and, uh, okay, okay uh, lastly, the uh, corner for the, um, the metal post that we saw, uh, the, uh, again, it's part of a kit. Uh, a post and with two brace posts on the side and, and it works quite well. Okay. Oh yeah. This is how they, they, they attach to that. Okay. So a um, couple of, of uh, general principles here. Now I, I do a lot of teaching and I don't believe in telling you to, okay, go go out and get a rototiller uh, and uh, till your garden. I don't use any power tools in my, in my own. I've never used a power tool in my garden. And I want to be able to teach this so that you don't need power tools for one. And for number two, I don't like rotor tools that well. Now, if you have sod, you're starting out with sod and you have a neighbor that has rotor tool, you know, no problem. Uh, it's an easy way to start your garden. Uh, although I will go into a couple other, other ways too. But this is basically my toolkit. Uh, I have a couple of small hand tools too, um, particularly for weeding, whatever. But I've got on the left-hand side, it's a digging fork. It's a very strong one. Uh, and I'll talk about those when we get into talking about soil, uh, soil fertility, a spade, um, a rake to prepare my beds. The, the next uh, item is a shuffle hoe, and we're going to talk about that, I think, uh, when we talk about pests, uh, because I consider it to be my main, uh, my main um, control of weeds, and I, it's, it's really effective. Again, it's called Swan Neck Shuffle Hole. It's my favorite. There are other varieties, other types, uh, and we'll look at those when we talk about, about weeds, uh, I think, next week. Uh, a hoe for, for digging if I need it, and a spade for bringing in compost, uh, shoveling, whatever. So that's basically my, my toolkit. Um, oh, the other thing about uh, uh, rototillers is um, uh, they do a great job of fluffing up the soil, but when they do, they break up uh, what's called soil aggregates. And I'm going to show those. I'm going to skip to the next slide. This is a really good um, uh, uh, soil. It's, it's over at the, the Rodale Institute, uh, Rodale Research Institute. Rodale is the publisher of, uh, was the publisher of Organic Gardening, which published for about 50, 60 years. I think it finally stopped a year ago. But you can see, um, uh, let me get the pen out again. Okay. Uh, particularly right in here, it's a good shot of, you see a lot of, of pea-sized crumbles. Um, those are what we call soil aggregates. The fact that they're um, uh, in small pea, uh, uh, pea shapes like that, it allows air and water to, to, to infiltrate the soil. Uh, so it's a lot less likely to, to run off. Uh, using uh, particularly rototilling type tillage, uh, you see, this is a this is a non-organic soil. I'm going to point a few other things out about it. But when they were digging, you see how compacted it got. Uh, there are some some uh, aggregates uh, uh, to, to the. Uh, let me get my pen. Sorry. Yeah, this is this is really uh, compaction, and uh, it tends to happen in soil with low organic matter. The whole principle behind organic farming is to try to raise that organic matter. It allows. Uh, uh, brings in nutrients, it allows uh, better infiltration, you know, aggregation, encourages aggregation, better water infiltration. Uh, and this is what you can get if you uh, rotorfill too much or if you, you're not careful about putting organic matter back in the soil. Uh, let's see, okay, yeah. Uh, so this is back to the Rodale uh, Institute. Uh, it shows you this, this, um, 
is a soil profile from land that's been managed conventionally for the last probably 35, 35 years or so. And uh, we just looked at, at some compaction issues. Um, but notice the, the brown soil goes down about eight inches. And I'm going to show you the next one, which is part of the same experimental, uh, the same experiment, but this soil has been managed organically for the last 35 years. And the numbers are a little hard to read, uh, but down here is, is about 13 inches. And that's where the organic matter and the soil structure has been influenced by the organic practices. So we're really doing a lot of good for ourselves if we, we use good organic practices, put a lot of organic matter in the soil. Not only is this soil deeper, uh, but it's richer. In there is organic matter and there's nutrients in there that are not available so much in, the, in this, this subsoil down here, the, the lighter color. So um, yeah, uh, we're looking, we're talking about healthy soil here. Okay, so uh, if you're just starting out, there's a couple of things you can do to speed things along. Uh, don't have a rotor tiller, which again, I'd, I'd actually discourage it. Uh, you can lay a, a, a piece of plastic over the soil. This is black plastic. Um, it, uh, it takes maybe a month, uh, maybe less during the, during the summertime to kill all the grass that's below there. You can do the same thing with a clear piece of plastic. Uh, and in the summertime, it'll pretty much kill the grass in about a day. That's what I'm told. I haven't tried it, but uh, there are several farmers in the in Nofa's uh, region that, um, that have done that, and they say they, they can kill it in a day. They, um, they can kill all the grass, but the, the heat that's built up under clear plastic will also kill a lot of your microbes, so you really need to um, be careful of that. Uh, this will not have as much of an effect on the microbes in the soil. It just kills the vegetation. Now, um, I don't use plastic mulch uh, in my own uh, growing. And this is basically a piece of, uh, you know, it's a piece of scrap plastic. Uh, it happens to be one I picked up at a, um, a dairy farm. Dairy farmers also, all, all often, uh, if they have a, a good harvest year and they don't, they're not able to store everything in their silos, they will put them in what's called ag bags or they'll put them into bunkers that they have to cover with a piece of plastic. It's thick. I uh, believe this one is white on the other side. So I actually can use it to, to um, protect fro from frost. Uh, and I don't want to use the black side up to protect from frost because if I forget it, if I forget to take it off in the morning, it gets too hot in there. And I've actually killed strawberry plants that way. Um, so basically I just use it for a couple, uh, it, it's, it's recycled plastic and it, um, uh, it's, I've had it for 15 years. Uh, it gets very little use. I don't start my, my, my beds this way. I just put this on as a demonstration of how I, I could. I actually think maybe I did use this to plant pawpaws, uh, pawpaw trees, um, but I, uh, uh, I didn't prepare the soil this way. Just a, a, an easy way, a quick way. Um, yeah, I think there was a, a concern expressed about, about plastic. It, it is allowed in organic as long as you take it off the soil. Uh, Plastic will photodegrade. This is actually probably six mil. The um, uh, plastic that's used for mulch, it's also allowed for organic. It's a much, much smaller uh, mill, which means it's thinner. I think it's maybe one or two. And that will quickly degrade uh, after one season. So you can't use that in one, one year. So that's why I, I'm not crazy about it because it's, you know, it, it's plastic that has to be thrown away. And sometimes it's, it's too dirty to easily recycle. So I, I dis discourage its use, but it has some real, real good uh, applications when you're first starting out. The other way to do it, uh, another way to do it is with cardboard. Um, uh, basically, this will rot uh, into the soil. As far as I know, there's nothing in it that's bad. Uh, if you are worried about that, you can use um, newspaper. Um, uh, again, um, if you use newspaper, it, it needs to be about 10 sheets thick in order to do much, uh, uh, to, to, to be an effective mulch that will kill what's underneath. And even that, I've seen things grow through that that are really strong, such as thistle. Um, if you cover it with Al? a- Yes. I have a question. Sure. Um, 
this cardboard looks like it's not corrugated. I guess I understand that now we cannot use corrugated cardboard for organic farming. Uh, well, you, you can in New Jersey. Uh, it, it's not universal. Uh, I, okay. I think you're right. I think it's not. It, uh, the corrugated cardboard might have some blues in it, and mm -hmm. I don't know enough about it. I know it's not allowed. Uh, corrugated cardboard is not allowed by the, the uh, certification program in New Jersey, but I'm not sure that's universal. Um, I was, however, uh, involved in the early days of looking into into newspapers. And one thing you don't want to use is the glossy colored pages. Now, some, some people have interpreted that as to you not using any colored inks. And my research says that that's not true. If it's colored ink on, a, on the front page of a paper, it's, it's actually, that ink is made with soy oil. So uh, it's, it's the glossy, uh, to get the gloss, I need to add a little lead, I think. Uh, something to that effect, so you, you don't want to put that in your garden. But just the regular newspapers, if you're all concerned about the color, uh, you know, you can remove the front page. It's usually where most of the color is, if, if there is any in at all. Um, yeah, thanks, good, good, good question, Nagisa. Uh, so getting corrugated cardboard is not as easy as getting corrugated cardboard, because most is corrugated. Um, I don't know exactly, I'm not positive this is not corrugated, but, uh, and then I'm not sure what, if there is a concern about glues. Um, but I, I know that there is enough concern that New Jersey doesn't allow it. Um, so several other approaches, um, uh, raised, this is a type of raised bed. I consider myself to grow in raised beds, but I do not use any wooden sides. Um, basically when I started, I took the soil that was in the pathways, I shoveled it up, uh, and I keep my soil loose. It, it automatically keeps it about six inches above my pathways. This is another way to do it. Um, uh, again, I would not use treated wood. You, you could not use treated wood in, in an organic system. I don't think this is. Uh, and talk, if, you, if you're going to buy these, I'm sorry, if you're going to make one of these, um, talk to your lumber supply store. I think some of them, some woods will last longer than others. I think hemlock is one, um, but I'm not an expert on that. Um, and uh, uh, so this is basically on top of, of soil. So it's, it's an easy way to start. Uh, it wasn't any you know, having to just, just all that soil you put on top of there kill whatever vegetation was, was below. Um, if you're in an area with less space or you may be in an area that has some previous uh, non-agricultural use or possibly some previous contamination, you can basically build up. Um, this I think is on an old parking lot. It's a, a church garden. Um, uh, let's see, David Byers, who I, I think is on our call, um, actually built these. And a question came up about what to use on the bottom. I, I don't have a, a, a significant answer. And on the bottom, meaning between the, the, the soil and the, um, uh, the basically the driveway, the idea would probably be a um, hardware cloth, uh, not hardware cloth, um, landscape cloth. Um, but I don't know that you can buy those in small pieces. Um, a landscape cloth is basically, a, a, it is a plastic, but it, uh, it won't rot when it's, it's not exposed to light. Uh, and it does allow water to penetrate. So you don't want something on the bottom that would just hold the water in. And uh, one of the listeners um, uh, on our live presentation asked about stones on the bottom. And I think that's probably perfectly fine. Um, maybe in a future session, if um, uh, we can ask David to elaborate on that. Uh, now, um, uh, these look like, okay, they're, they're well built. Uh, and you say, you might say to yourself, well, I don't have those skills, but I wanted, I wanted to use that type of a raised bed. The um, Gardener Supply Company, which is a mail order company, and it's in your resources, um, they sell a lot of um, uh, different types of metal, uh, plastic, uh, uh, material that you can use to make ra uh, this type of raised bed. Uh, I would uh, suggest uh, uh, maybe getting a catalog or looking at what they have on what they have online, and uh, that might be a good alternative as well as ones that are on stands. Uh, you know, that actually don't even touch the ground; they're just basically uh, in in uh, uh, beds that are raised, <laughs> no, no no touch to the ground. And also, uh, going back to the irrigation materials, there's a lot of they, they have a lot of uh, different types of irrigation materials. Uh, Gardener Supply that were um, more appropriate for small gardeners. Uh, somebody had asked about um, some of the safety issues with those, and I'm not familiar with those. I can't address them. Uh, I have a 19, uh, sorry, 2019 
uh, garter supply catalog. Didn't say anything about safety issues with uh, any of the materials there, but uh, maybe there's some in the more recent ones. Okay, so um, let's go into crops. I want to start out by uh, getting rid of water. Thank you. Um, so on page two of your handouts, I've given you a um, uh, basically a, a planting schedule. And if you notice, it only goes to May or June. The last class, we're going to be talking about extending the season into the fall and into the winter, into the next spring, actually. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of the early crops here. And I'll try to give you some, some details, uh, hopefully some, some uh, tips on how you can get better germination, better stands. And I'm only bringing this up uh, to show you what's available to you. If you can find your own copy of this and follow along, make notes, that's fine. Otherwise, you have it. You can refer to it later. And I think I've got it memorized. Um, now, uh, there are folks on uh, uh, that are participating in, in this first session um, all the way from uh, Minnesota and uh, upstate New York and to Massachusetts. And so we're, we're in different growing zones. So you can Google this on your own computer, USDA harding, uh, plant hardiness zone map, um, and, and it will tell you where you are. But I'm giving everybody a few minutes or a minute to look at this and figure out where you are on there. Because I know, again, we have people from upstate New York. Uh, and see if you can interpret your, uh, your zone. Because I'm going to show you the next slide, which uh, gives their recommendation. Not their recommendation, but their... Um, uh, first and last fall uh, frost dates uh, for all the zones. And it turns out that I think everybody on this call, except for maybe Minnesota, um, are in areas with fairly similar first and last frost dates. So I, I question some of the accuracy of that. Um, uh, I think uh, in New Jersey, it's all in either yellow, which would be seven or six green. Uh, again, New York State is, there are some green areas, um, uh, you know, some yellow areas, I think even along, on Long Island. Um, and it's not, you, you're getting into the really colder areas when you get into the Adirondacks and, and the green and white mountains of, of Vermont. So I think we're probably, uh, most of us are going to be in that uh, five, six, and seven uh, zones. And the significance of that is um, if you notice down the bottom, five, six, and seven, uh, they all have first and last frost dates of October 15th and April 15th. Now, again, I question that. Uh, those seem to be averages because I know that I've had frost before October 15th, and I'm probably on the warmer side of this um, scheme. And I've certainly had um, frost well after April 15th. But, uh, their averages. Uh, and again, I, I'm not sure why they didn't give more detail because I don't think that um, central New Jersey is going to be the same as, the, for instance, the Cortland area of New York. Um, but we can kind of go by this. We're, we're all talking about the same area. Okay, so I'm going to go uh, crop by crop, uh, kind of following the um, uh, schedule I had. Um, this is spinach. Uh, I'm uh, uh, let's see, I'm going against what I said, but I don't talk about the fall at all, because this was actually spinach uh, planted in probably early September. Um, and I don't remember if I harvested anything in the fall. I didn't plant it for the fall crop. I planted it for a um, uh, for spring crop. Um, spinach, as long as you get it up to, you know, four or five inches high, it will overwinter. It does a pretty good job of overwintering. The, the leaves don't seem to be uh, bothered. Um, I think I probably took this photo in, in uh, early May. So it wasn't that much of a jump over some of my, my spring planted crops, but it was a jump over. The problem with spinach overwintering is not from killing of the leaves. I, I, I think maybe the, the leaves will die back and then it'll and grow new ones. I've kind of forgotten, I haven't done it in a few years. What the problem is, is, is uh, the roots breaking off because of frost heaving. Now, frost heaving, uh, think of, um, we've all seen bare soil in March, for instance, and there's cracks in it. The reason there's cracks in it is because there's moisture in that soil, and when the ground freezes on cold nights, it expands. 
when it contracts on the warm days, it shrinks back down again, but it leaves these frost, uh, um, these cracks, which are called frost heaves, and they can break the root of the spinach plant. So you need a little bit of mulch. Uh, well, you need mulch. I won't say a little bit, but uh, you don't need an awful lot uh, just to stop that frost heaving in the wintertime. Uh, and if you can effectively stop that, you should have a crop uh, in early spring. Okay, uh, peas, a lot of people say plant them by, um, plant them by, uh, what is it, St. Patrick's Day. I find that even this year, our, our, we had a lot of warm days in, in early March, and our soil, I think, was fairly warm uh, <clears throat> by, by St. Patrick's Day. Um, but I still find that if I plant early, peas, um, if they spend too much time in the ground, they'll rot. And so I, put, I actually put my planting back to early April. Um, and um, I found that it's hard to get a really good stand of peas. When I mean stand, meaning you plant, you know, 100 seeds, you get 100 seeds to pop up. No, sometimes you plant 100 seeds, you get 40 to pop up. So um, I have uh, found a method that I think works quite well, and that is to pre-germinate pre them. Um, so... I will look at my calendar, not look at my calendar, look on the, um, uh, at the weather for the next few days and find out when I want to plant my seeds. I'll back off a few days and I will soak them. I soak them for two and a half days. So in other words, you look ahead and say, okay, uh, actually, you know, two and a half days out in the morning, it's a good day to plant. I've tried soaking them for three days and they get a little brittle and I think they get damaged when they get put in the ground. Uh, and two days are probably all right. Two and a half seems to be the ideal. So now I will go ahead and plant these in the soil. And um, uh, let's see. Now, if you were asking me how far apart I'm gonna space these plants, I say, you know, I think I plant peas about three inches apart. And I, have, I plant them in four rows in a bed. My beds are about three and a half feet wide. And I put two rows of staking in, which I'll get into in a minute. But I don't have all that stuff memorized. And I find that um, some of your, your better seed catalogs, and maybe in all seed catalogs, but they will tell you in the seed catalog how far apart to put. They usually give you a range. It may say two to three inches or three or four inches. And so I'm not going to go into um, planting spacing. Uh, I, I urge you all to look at your catalogs. Um, the one I, the two that I use most for that are Johnny's and High Mowing, and those are both in your your resource, um, one of your resource pages on seven or page seven or eight of your um, handout. And if you don't have a catalog, uh, there is a way you can go into the Johnny's, um, uh, what do you call it, their website, and I forget exactly what it's called. But fish around for a while, and I think there's some kind of tutorials on um, the different crops. And in there, there's a whole page on, on a crop, which, you know, give you all the information you need, including planting, planting time, you know, after the last frost and spacing. It, it gives it for all the crops. So, again, I, I'm not going to get into that detail because I don't have all those memorized. Um, it really helps if you inoculate your pea seed. Peas are a legume. Legumes fix nitrogen in the soil, and they do it in conjunction with a certain bacteria. I think it's called rhizo, rhizobacteria or something like that. Um, and um, you can also buy the inoculant when you purchase your seeds. Um, basically, I just put some of the, the powder inoculant in a little jar, shake them around, and uh, I, I have not done that with my um, seeds that, uh, sorry, my pea seeds that I've uh, pre-soaked. I, I do that after they come out of the uh, soaking seems to stick a little bit better, but uh, you can do it when they dry too. You can see it, it, it sticks right to the, um, to the seed itself. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, I did want to mention, uh, talking about seed catalogs, um, I hope you have, you all have some seed because I'm, I've heard that uh, some of the larger mail or seed companies are only shipping to their farm customers for the first few weeks in April. Uh, they're just trying to do that in support of, of the, the farm businesses, but seeds are kind of really short supply because everybody is trying to get them. So if you have seed left over from last year, um, try it. Uh, some, some 
types of seed do well for several years, some don't. Um, peas, I find I can plant two years. Um, lettuce, I can, but it, I don't get as good a germination a second year. And uh, things like the brassica family, I find I can keep them for several years. So um, again, just a little bit of a warning, she seeds in short supply. Uh, share it with your neighbors if you have extra or you know, give them last year's seed if they can't get in. Um, okay, back to peas. Uh, uh, I like to stake them. I use a staking system with wooden uh, stakes that can be purchased at most garden supply stores. If you notice, it's tapered at the end for easy uh, hammering into the ground. I shouldn't say easy. Uh, it depends how soft your soil is, but I find that they go into the you know, first few inches pretty easily. But then after that, I have to hammer it with a mallet, uh, probably a, maybe a large hammer might work. Um, this is actually a sledgehammer. I prefer to have a small sledgehammer, but I, but I don't. So, um, but uh, if you can put this, you know, some kind of an old bottle, this is an old shampoo bottle. Uh, I put that over the top of the stake because it, it takes a lot of the damage that would otherwise occur to the stake. It, it really increases the life of the stake. And then um, I run um, string uh, about every four to six inches. Uh, I think probably like maybe five inches. Uh, you see those horizontal lines, those are all, it's all twine. Um, and eventually those will all go, go in my compost that are not treated. I think they may have some treated treated twine, certainly stay away from that. Uh, and the, um, the peas don't really have to be trained, uh, maybe a little bit. Sometimes they start growing in the pathway and they need to be pushed back, but they, they will find those. They, um, I think they, it's some kind of a light sensitive thing. They look for a little bit of shade they know there's something to climb up. So, uh, okay. Now, scallions. Um, <clears throat> you'd say, I don't eat scallions very much. Uh, we've, we've actually <clears throat> learned to like scallions more. They're one of the easiest things to grow. In March, I buy, I, now I buy about five bunches of scallions. And I, I grow my own onions too. And um, <clears throat> by March, sometimes I'm out of my own onions. Uh, sometimes I have some left, so I put them back in storage for a month. And I cut the tops off of these scallions. We use them as we would onions for the month of March. But I save the last inch with the root. All these I can just put right in the ground. I space them about three inches. And this is a picture from June 11th. Uh, that's what they look like. I, you know, easiest thing to grow. Um, and um, June is time when we're almost always out of my own onions. And so we start harvesting these and using them as, as we would onions. They're you know, a little bit, maybe a little bit different flavor than a, than a bulb onion, but uh, they last for a couple months until uh, the onion harvest in late July, early, early, um, early August. Okay, um, <clears throat> onions. Um, you can plant your own seed inside if you have that ability. And I'm not gonna talk much about, about uh, inside planting because most of us don't have the, um, the facilities to do that. But again, if you go to Gardener Supply and maybe some of the other seed catalogs, they often have these little kits that you can buy. But onions is not one I would suggest because it takes about, I think, 10 weeks, 10 or 12 weeks. Uh, and, it's, and it's good to get, it's tough to get a, a healthy plant. Um, I, I buy my, uh, my sets from Johnny's um, they're untreated. I don't think they're actually certified organic. I don't know if they have those yet. Um, possibly, uh, and I don't think high mowing, which is only organic seeds, has these, but they may. Um, so there's about 75 onions in this bunch. It probably costs about $15 if you just buy one bunch. If you can go to get together with neighbors, uh, if you buy three bunches there, the price is considerably less than five bunches. It's considerably less still. Um, but uh, you say, okay, well, I can get Gar uh, not garlic, um, onion sets at my local supply store, garden supply store. Um, I find that I get better onions with these plants and it's worth the extra cost to me. Um, I think this, the sets to, to me have always taken a long time to start up and a long time to, to grow and I don't get as big a bulb. So I would highly suggest buying these plants. Again, um, when they come, there'll be directions on how far to plant them apart. I think I, I go about I, I know go about five inches. I think the recommendation is four. I, I try them for larger bulbs, which I think store a little bit better, but um, four or five inches apart is fine. Okay, now I'm gonna get into some direct seeding. Uh, and again, I do, I don't, well actually until this year when, when uh, I became quarantined along with everybody else. Um, 
I don't generally grow seedlings in the spring. I don't have an indoor uh, grow light. Uh, and I find that I don't quite get enough sun through my windows uh, uh, in early spring anyways for growing things. So I plant lettuce about every two to three weeks. Um, and I, I plant small patches. Um, this probably is uh, in the middle, that's a row of lettuce. I don't know what on the other two sides. And in the back, probably some lettuce that I'd already I already harvested, uh, started harvesting, and some is just growing in the, in the um, okay, so with small seeds, which is going to be include uh, lettuce, carrots, um, beets, and other small, maybe uh, some of your brassicas like turnips. Um, <clears throat> I make a little furrow, a uh, quarter, a half an inch deep, and I, and I sprinkle my seeds in. Now, I'm not worried if they don't go to the bottom uh, <clears throat> because lettuce uh, and carrot seeds, it's actually, those are actually part of the umbellifera family. I'm not sure I'm saying it right. Sorry for the scientists. Um, but uh, they, their seed actually likes to be on the surface. But if you leave it on the surface and you just get dry weather, they're not going not gonna to germinate that well. So my little, my little trench there, I actually go through and chop it with my hand perpendicular to the way the trench is going. So it covers, what it does is look at the bottom, it covers some seed, some seed is not covered. Uh, and if we get a lot of, uh, uh, you know, good, good uh, either water well, or we get some nice rains for the next few days, uh, the ones that are a little more exposed might be the first to pop up, they may be um, the best. Uh, some of the ones that are, that are buried will, will do better if it's dry. Uh, so it kind of gives me a little bit of uh, protection. Okay, this, these are two of my little trenches. Um, and you can see they're both planted in lettuce seeds, but why are you only seeing dots down the bottom? Well, I'll, I'll show you why. Um, because I have uh, a preference for using pelleted seed. This is, um, uh, this is all lettuce seed. On the right is, is pelleted, uh, and uh, on the other side is um, uh, non-pelleted, and so, Pelleted is basically it's a small coating of, of clay that's it's around the seed, and once it's in the soil, you know it'll it'll dissolve. Um, it's just clay. It's allowed for organics, no problem with that. I, there may be some types of pelleting that are not, um, and uh, I just find that I can make better use of the seed. It's more expensive, but I can space them a lot further apart because I have go back here. I can actually put those right in where I want them, where the, the, at the top, you can't see the lettuce seed, but it's been sprinkled in there. Uh, and so I'm actually using a lot of seeds. So I don't think the cost is, is significant. And I found I've gotten a little bit better germination with pelleted seed. Uh, it's common on lettuce and carrot seeds. So the next thing I think we're gonna look at is carrots. Uh, again, the planting is gonna be the exact same way. Um, hopefully you'll get, uh, Good enough germination that you'll end up thinning uh, and depending upon how closely you put them some of those thinnings might be small carrots that you can actually eat. Um, I like to end up with carrots about three or four inches apart by the end of the season and, and, and get some decent size. Um, beets about the same time we're still talking about early and mid-April um, uh, and um, now I found a, I've had a problem with beets that um, I think several other uh, people have mentioned um, that uh, I don't get great stands. It's similar to peas. I get some, sometimes I get these big areas that are, uh, there's nothing growing at all. Um, I think there's several reasons. Uh, one is I think the birds really like the, the, um, uh, the beet uh, tops. And so they'll see little seedlings. I've seen uh, birds in my uh, beet patch. Maybe because they're, they're red, they show up more than the green things. Uh, maybe there's something in them that they know about that we don't know. Um, and uh, so what I'm trying this year for the, well, actually I tried it last year, uh, but I am growing some seedlings this year. This is in potting soil. Um, uh, potting soil is generally available through you know, any kind of garden supply store. Whole Foods, if there's a Whole Foods in the area, they have organic potting soil. Uh, you really have to ask some questions if you buy it at your uh, at your garden supply store because uh, they may not know if it's organic. And if and organic is not is a word that's regulated for food. It's not regulated for for farm supplies. 
So, um, you know, if, if it's being sold as organic potting soil, you probably have to trust it. Uh, what it, it does is basically a mix of compost and probably peat moss. Um, uh, but then they'll, uh, yeah, again, the nutrients are probably coming from compost. Um, so, um, yeah, j just be careful. Again, I'm not, um, this is an organic gardening class. If all you can get this year is something that's, um, that's, uh, you, you're questioning whether it's organic, uh, approved, um, you know, you may have to do the best you can because uh, I think everything may be in short supplies. Uh, a lot of people want to start gardening. So these were, this picture was taken uh, two days ago, but I'm, I'm going to focus back on beets because on the left are, are lettuce plants, which I've never planted my own early in the spring. I've always just direct seeded. But in the past, I've gone to Whole Foods and they've always had some, some uh, flats of, of lettuce, which I usually just buy like four and put those in to give my, um, my, direct seeded ones, a little bit of a jump. You know, the, the, the ones I'm transplanting are gonna be ready a, a week or two earlier. Ah, so <clears throat> if you notice, there's um, sometimes as many as four or five beets coming up in each one of those cells. Um, that's okay. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plant each one of these cells when they're ready, which is probably gonna be another week or two. They've gotta to get to be four or five inches high. Um, I'm gonna plant them about a foot apart. And so that will allow them to grow in bunches. Um, as the bunches grow, you can thin them by taking the biggest ones, using those and leaving the other ones in, and the other ones will just get bigger. So um, it, it eliminates the problem of the germination in the soil. And uh, you can do this late enough in the, in the spring where if you have any kind of a, a south-facing window, I do have these in a south-facing window, but I also have a south-facing steps in the front of my house. So I put them out every day I can. It's colder outside than it is inside, so they may grow a little slower, but I want them to grow slower because if they're growing too fast inside, not in full sunlight, they'll get leggy and they won't be as strong. So by putting them outside, uh, even when the weather's a little chilly, but full sun, um, I'm, I'm slowing them down, but I'm, I think I'm creating stronger plants. Okay, chard can be planted about the same time as beets and it can be, continue to be planted through probably through midsummer. Um, okay, potatoes, next up, I like to wait until the soil warms up a little bit, uh, by, at least by early May, and uh, get my, my potatoes in. I plant them simply by making a trench with my hoe. And if you notice on the, this is probably, I don't know, a month or two after planting, um, I will, as I come through and, and weed with my hoe, which again, I'm going to talk about that in session four, I think. Um, I break down that mound that I, that I made in the middle when I tr made two trenches and it brings it around the, uh, the potatoes, which actually is, is good because it covers up the uh, uh, potatoes from getting direct sunlight. Um, so uh, again, I uh, put them about, I forget, about a foot apart, I think, but um, look in your seed catalogs and um, that'll give you the, the direction. I think I put my, my actual... Um, I have some fingerling varieties. I think they actually go closer than, um, than the larger varieties. And the two larger varieties I like the best are Red New Orleans. It seems to be the most, the easiest to grow. Um, it's a white potato, good for stews and things like that. And then the, uh, I have a, a yellow one. Um, uh, I can't remember the name of it right off the top of my head, but um, uh, it's, it's a, a yellow potato, more for, for baking, not baking, but for eating by itself. Okay, um, so, uh, you can buy seed potatoes from uh, seed catalogs and from garden supply stores, and uh, you can also put your own in. Now, the problem with putting your own potatoes in is if you had any disease in there from previous year, then you could be uh, in, uh, infecting your, your garden for the coming year. Um, whereas the, the seed potatoes that are purchased are generally examined to be uh, pest-free. Uh, disease-free particularly, and that's not 100% guaranteed. If you do plant your own, uh, or even if you're using larger uh, purchased um, potatoes, um, <clears throat> you can cut the larger ones apart and plant uh, both sides, as long as they each have a good strong eye, or several eyes, because it's, it's the eyes where the, the new shoots are going to come out of. But uh, if I planted uh, this potato today, uh, you can see it was just cut. Uh, it's going to rot. It needs about 
three days. I've tried two days and it hasn't worked. So I'm going to say a minimum of three days. Um, uh, but probably four or five is, is even better for just to sit in the, in the open air. And that uh, wound, which is basically the cut, will, will heal over. And uh, it will prevent it from rotting when you put it in the soil. Okay, so let's, uh, we're moving on to mid-May and my area, maybe some of your, uh, some of you that are in zone five, uh, probably wanna wait till Memorial Day, um, but I'm gonna start planting some of my frost intolerant uh, uh, plants. And again, I don't have, uh, I don't have a uh, grow light that I grow these on. It takes about, six to eight weeks to grow a good tomato plant, probably similar for peppers uh, and eggplant. Um, so I rely on buying my either a store or a farmer's market. Uh, most farmer's markets will have several organic uh, growers there. And I know that the farmer's markets in all of the NOFA states except for Vermont uh, have been considered an essential. They're gonna be open this year. Uh, uh, it's possible that it'll change as we get into May. Um, but I, I get mine from uh, you know, my local farmer's market. Um, happens to be a friend of mine. Uh, so I, I know what he, what he has every year. I, uh, and I'm not gonna get into varieties. Everybody has their own favorite. Um, but talk to you, whoever you're purchasing from. They usually know more about the varieties than, than I could, any information I can give you. Um, Okay, for, for the family of solanaceous plants, which some, some of you call nightshade, um, uh, which includes tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant, um, I pick off the bottom, uh, the bottom leaves. And if you notice, there was a leaf right here. Uh, you can see that one, and there was one on the other side. That's about four or five more inches of stem. And I wanna try to bury that up to here as much as possible. What that does is it allows the plant to convert what, what looks like little fuzz on the stem to new roots. So when I transplant, it's not only gonna be using the roots that are already in the soil here, it's gonna be growing new roots. So it's gonna allow this plant to take off a lot faster. And uh, there's no, the other thing too, is if you plant a, um, uh, a plant that's got too much top, top surface to it, uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty susceptible to strong winds. It can, it can knock over. So you want to put as much of that in the, in the soil as possible. Uh, okay, uh, I do give a little bit of a, a, a liquid fertilizer um, boost to things I put into the soil. Um, uh, Seedlings, I should say. Uh, this is an organic uh, fish and seaweed fertilizer that you probably have, uh, you can get others, other brands at your supply store. Um, again, uh, organic is not regulated in this product because it's not a food. Uh, uh, and some of your uh, supply uh, catalog, seed catalogs, I'm sorry, uh, will have uh, organic brands. And uh, I think the seed catalogs are gonna be careful about how they label them. Okay, so a uh, staking system uh, I happen to use um, is the same stakes. Uh, I drive them in and then I, uh, about every six inches, sometimes that's every four or five days of growth or sometimes it's a week of growth. I run a string from one stake to another and I go in front, uh, put my pen, pen in again. Uh, one week I'll go in front this way, the next week I'll go in the back. I plant two parallel rows in my bed. I offset them so they're, they're not competing with each other as much. Um, but this keeps them within that uh, you know, confinement of growing up. Now, with, uh, uh, I guess it's the next slide, is going to be uh, a sucker. Um, there's a controversy on um, whether or not to remove suckers. Basically, every time where you get a branch uh, coming out to the side, uh, it can start a whole new plant. This um, thing in the middle there is called a sucker. And uh, uh, there's a theory to remove them all. There's a theory to leave the plant alone and do it what it, um, what it usually does, uh, which is keep growing suckers. Now, the problem with, with suckers is um, that it can take energy out of the plant, so it won't put it into those little flowers you see above it to produce fruit. 
So I'm not going to try to quote the science on this. Again, there's, there's opinions on, on both sides. But here's what I do. Um, <clears throat> at the bottom of my plant, I always let one of the suckers go when the plant is young. So I actually have two stems growing up. And that's what I am enclosing in my, in my netting. Uh, not my, met, my netting, my uh, caging, whatever. Um, uh, and, and I'm not against the purchase cages. I find them a little awkward to use, but uh, you know, those, those round uh, cages that you can purchase. I just find the system is a little bit easier when I have so many of them. Um, okay, so I've let two, two stems go up and then I sucker for another month or and I, I, in other words, I remove these suckers for the next month, a month and a half. Um, after a while, the plants can get to be so big that I just can't keep up with the suckers. And I say, okay, do what you have to do. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, again, these guys can get big. I, my um, posts are probably coming out of the ground five feet and you see they're way over the top of them. Uh, those will eventually bend over. Sometimes they'll break uh, and I'm fine with five, you know, posts that are that big. Um, uh, I think Jared uh, mentioned it in his, uh, his hoop house and maybe in his field too. Um, he has some kind of a system where he can run a string down. So let's, let's convert it here. If I, if I ran a wire or a, a strong string at the top of my, two of my posts, and then I ran a string down to the base of the plant, uh, he kind of uses that string that comes down to, to train his uh, tomatoes to grow up it. Uh, I'm not sure I'm doing a, a, a great job of explaining it, but um, uh, just another variation on this. Now, um, for this, you really need some strong stakes. It, it, go back to peas for a minute. Uh, you can use branches. Uh, you can use old um, ski poles, I guess. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of chance for recycling. Probably even old fence. If you do use branches, I find that birch is the best because this the branches that go to the side, they're the strongest uh, maple and other things like that, the branches are more these and they they seem to be a little more brittle. Uh, okay, so let's see. Okay, sorry. All right, peppers. Um, uh, again, the same family, same planting time. Uh, uh, you usually find that the seedlings for peppers are not nearly as big as, as uh, tomatoes. They don't grow as fast. So uh, you can bury them. I wouldn't worry about uh, burying them quite as deep as peppers. Um, but uh, again, look in your catalog for, for planting uh, or online for planting distances. Generally, I, I try to keep uh, tomatoes about uh, 18, 20 inches apart. Uh, and because I'm training them up, that, that's, that is fine. Pepper's a little bit closer, uh, 15 to 12. Um, but I'm not the expert on that. The seed companies are, and they can give you more information. Uh, different types of peppers. Uh, again, I, I buy mine at uh, my local um, farmer's market uh, from a local farmer that I know is, is organic. Um, peppers will last longer into the, into the fall than, um, than tomatoes. Uh, seems like particularly the really ripe uh, Hot tomatoes, uh, hot peppers. Eventually, I just, uh, I, I think after I took this, this photo, because uh, this is the same bed that had tomatoes in it, and those are all gone. Uh, and that's just a cover crop growing right now. I just cut the whole thing and hung it upside down in my basement, and we just picked off this all, all year long. Um, eggplant, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. <laughs> I buy, we buy eggplant from the store. Actually, we don't really need any because we have plenty of other things. But eggplant, um, uh, for some reason, flea beetles seem to love eggplant. So I've had a really hard time keeping them healthy. Um, Jared, I think, was, uh, made a comment the other day that he, as long as the soil is, is healthy, um, he seems to be able to outgrow them. Uh, I think maybe the fact that I only had one or two, they all go to those one or two, and, and, um, and uh, really, they, they kind of decimate the leaves. I don't know why they, those flea beetles don't bother the other things that grow in the spring. But they do. So basically, um, if you're new, uh, I would make eggplant one of the last things you try. Um, and if you've been growing it for years and you're successful, then you're doing better than I am. Uh, beans, um, another uh, warm weather crop. I like to let the soil warm up, and I planted them. Uh, you know, late late uh, May. I planted them into June. Um, they have a they have a life. They will. Um, 
uh, you know, they'll produce really well and they'll start to go downhill, uh, produce less and eventually uh, kind of peter out. So you can actually succession, succession plant these if you have space. Uh, you plant some early and then maybe about three or four weeks later, plant some more. Probably only get about two, two plantings in and then it's gonna be too cold. Um, your cucurbit family um, includes your uh, squashes, your winter squashes, your summer squashes, your cucumbers, your uh, melons. Uh, again, I like to let the soil warm up into late May. Uh, I planted them into early June. I planted them into late June, actually, uh, or mid to late June. Um, not as successfully, but I, I like to let the soil warm up. So uh, I don't give you, I'm not going to give you a specific date because if, if you have a lot of cold weather in May um, and then all of a sudden you get some sunny weather, I like to let, let that sun warm the soil for, for a few days first. Um, I direct seed all mine. You can transplant them. I don't think there's a need to. Again, melons, um, pumpkins, uh, all that family. Um, and what I do is, this is my cucurbit bed. Everything in this bed, which is about 30 feet long, is cucurbits. In the front, you're seeing uh, butternut squash. I, I plant them all, and I call them hills, but they're not really hills. Um, I plant three seeds at whatever spacing I want the, the, the mature plant to end up in. So, for instance, in the front, you see two, at least two butternut squashes in, in each space. Now, the reason I planted three is because um, the third one didn't come up. So I want to make sure I have at least one. Um, and um, I leave those about two feet apart. They need a lot of room to spread. And then in the back, the um, slower growing germinating ones, you can't really see, but there's cucumbers uh, and, uh, and melons, and they're a lot closer together. Uh, the, the hills are a lot closer together. Um, okay, uh, this is what that winter squash patch looks like, mm, probably late, uh, late July, something like that. Okay, so um, the last two, two slides are also in your handouts as pages three and four, I believe. So uh, I, I'm outlining here what my rotation is. The reason I rotate is because disease and uh, uh, disease which would be um, specific to a certain crop uh, can uh, develop during the growing season and some of it will stay in the soil. So I wanna make sure my plants are in a different place next year. Um, and uh, the other thing is nutrients. Uh, different, different families have different needs for nutrients. So. Uh, if I'm always planting in the same place, I may have exhausted some particular um, you know, nutrient where I'm switching around, they, they, uh, uh, it, it makes better, more efficient use of nutrients. So uh, quickly, I, I go by families, uh, red clover, I always have, uh, I have seven, seven, per, uh, I'm sorry, seven annual beds. And um, uh, let's see, each of these is um, a family, basically a family or a group of crops. Cucurbits, that's the melons. And squashes, um, early crops were my uh, can be garlic peas, spinach. Uh, uh, used to be onions. I've actually changed that around, but particularly early lettuce, uh, carrots, beets, whatever. Uh, Solanaceous family. Those are the tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, potatoes, and then uh, I have one uh, bed which is I specifically keep in cover crop until halfway through the season. So I have one ready to plant my my fall crops of lettuce, carrots, et cetera. Um, and then a, a final one for my spring fall. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, one for brassicas and then one for my late fall crops, okay. So um, now I don't expect everybody to have seven beds. Some of you may only have one, may only be you know eight feet or six feet long. Um, or you know some other type of situation where you're just planting up against the house. Uh, so think of these not necessarily in beds, uh, just maybe in plants. You, you have maybe just one tomato plant, just put it in a different place next year. And if you have a smaller area, uh, then the first thing I would probably do is take out the cover crop. Uh, it's not producing anything. And then take a look at your curbits. They take up a lot of space. Uh, and if anything, you may want to um, just put in cucumbers and mix them in somewhere else. Uh, that'll give you some salad. Uh, something uh, salad green, not salad green, but something to go with your salads if you can get lettuce. 
uh, plant in another area. Um, your early crops, okay, we're all want to all want to try to to grow some of those unless you just have enough room for something like tomatoes. Um, but you know, get those lettuce seeds in the ground. Um, get your carrot seeds in if you want. Carrots are slow germinated; they're a little harder to grow. So lettuce lettuce is uh, top top priority, and it'll give you some some um, good salads through uh, spring. Um, Solanaceous family, again, um, and then uh, uh, I, I did include um, cover crops in this rotational thing, which we'll talk about next week. But um, yeah, you may want to just go into, you know, combine a bed with some, some brassicas and save some room for some later crops like beans and, and fall crops. And those arrows are basically just how I, I rotate two beds at a time just to keep things apart a little bit. And there's another reason I do that, but I'll get into that when we talk about cover crops. So um, I think that's the last slide. Um, trying to remember if we had any um, other uh, questions from uh, from our um, live session. Uh, Nagishi, do you remember any? Yeah, I think there were a number of questions about um, the fertilizer. Some people were wondering um, what to do if they are allergic to fish or shellfish. Mm -hmm. Can you suggest some alternatives? Well, um, I, again, I don't know the specific brands. Uh, if you notice, the, the fish fertilizer I used was uh, fish and seaweed. There is a brand that I don't remember the name of that was just seaweed, so maybe that would work. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's made from kelp meal. Um, and you can make your own from your compost. You can, um, you can, uh, you know, put a handful of uh, compost in a, um, uh, you know, just in a jar or something like that and, and use that. Now, uh, biodynamics is a, is a type of, uh, gardening that uses a lot of, uh, let's see, really hand intensive methods, I guess. And they have a certain way of preparing that compost where you're supposed to stir it so many, so much in one direction and then stir it in another direction. I, I don't, um, not recommending, uh, I, I guess it works well, but it, I, I don't know the, the details and I don't know that we want to put that much work in it. Um, I'm going to talk about compost next time and uh, one of the things I'll talk about is uh, uh, briefly is um, warm, warm composting which you can do inside if you, you know, if you live in an apartment and at the bottom of the worm uh, composting bin uh, is um, a liquid so that liquid could be used also. Uh, can't think of any there's probably some other ideas too but that, that's the main one. All right great well that that um is incentive to tune in for the next one <laughs> on composting. Yeah. And I think we should um, stop the recording now. Okay. <laughs> so see you, I hope you see you all next week. Uh, bye. Okay. Now. Thank you very much.